Norm Young, welcome to the episode, mate. Great to have you on board. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I find myself listening to your podcasts often. So to be asked to come here, that's a big deal for me. So thanks for having me, Dan. Oh, thanks, mate. Uh, now, for everybody that's uh, watching and listening, let's get a little bit of a background into Norm Young. Uh, you know, where, how have you, you started in this space and, and what is, is keeping you busy at the moment? Sure. Um, my name's Norm Young. I'm from Ontario, Canada, uh, about an hour outside of Toronto. Uh, I've been in IT for like 20 years, and in that whole time, I've been focused on data. Uh, I was a, a database administrator for a long time, working in General Motors, uh, did some database development uh, as well. And then I, after doing 10 years in manufacturing, I moved out, and then I, I moved into higher education. I spent 10 years there uh, doing everything from PeopleSoft ERP support, uh, data, where, data warehouse, uh, business intelligence programs. Um, and in the last, I don't know, five years or so, uh, when we were starting to use Power BI at the university I was at, gave me an opportunity to start working with SharePoint and Office 365. and. Um, it was at that point I realized that I was enjoying the, the collaboration side, uh, SharePoint, Teams, building solutions with uh, all those tools in the Microsoft 365 toolbox. And um, I started to make that focus on uh, uh, on the collaboration side, like I said, and uh, that led into, uh, you know, diving deep into SharePoint and the Teams and, and doing what I could inside of the Power Platform. Um, after 10 years in higher ed, I... I needed a change and uh, I'm currently working at a, a company called Unlimited Viz. And a lot of people won't know what that is, but they will know the products that we make. We make something called Tigraph. Tigraph is a uh, analytics solution that's targeted at Microsoft 365 usage in analytics. So it was a perfect combination and a perfect opportunity for me to marry up my data skills with all of the uh, uh, the hands-on and the skills and experience that I had working in Microsoft 365. Yeah, it's a Canadian company, and uh, we do a lot of uh, usage analytics around uh, SharePoint. Uh, you know, to, to know how the the internet is performing, uh, to see how the investments that uh, marketing communications people are making are, are paying off. Uh, lots of work in Yammer, where we uh, help community managers understand the effectiveness of the communities that they're building teams to understand the adoption, the usage, and uh, many other uh, uh, solutions on those different collaborative workloads in Microsoft 365. And so at Unlimited Viz and Tigraph, I, I help to do adoption with new users and, and customers. And uh, to the side of that, I get to uh, help do uh, some business process improvement and uh, started with things like Microsoft Lists and Power Automate. Now we're moving into things like Dataverse and uh, the other mm. uh, apps and services that exist in the Power Platform. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. You talk about the, the data and the usage and the adoption and, and that type of thing. And I think that's become uh, so much more important, you know, especially over the last sort of 12, 24 months, 36 months. Mm. I think a lot more uh, organizations are really starting to want to get an understanding of how their users and how the organization as a whole is, is using the platform. Are you finding that... Um, you know, especially around, well, uh, let's say Teams usage, uh, are you finding that there's a lot more uh, importance now on on the the usage analytics of, of Office 365 compared to maybe, you know, three or four years ago? I think so. At first, a lot of the analytics around Teams were to help guide organizations from their Skype transition into Teams. Mm, yeah, yeah. But when the pandemic hit, it was a different shift. It was, it was just pushing everyone into that space. And so when you look at the telemetry and you look at how people are using the data, like almost everyone is using Teams for meetings or for chats or other types of calls, but they may not be taking those next levels where they're taking their work into the team. Mm. You know, they may not be having those channel conversations where they're working out loud. They may not be collaborating in those files inside of the channel. So you do see that there is a tendency for some people to work in silos. And, and that's why 
things like Microsoft lists are, are, are a great way to um, bring some of those buried spreadsheets and those other bits of localized work that are sitting in your, your my documents or your desktop or in OneDrive and surface them into an area where people can start working out loud and mm. working together. Yeah. Now, good good segue into Microsoft List actually, because that's a, a topic I, I want to talk talk to you uh, quite a bit about now. And I, I see now you're a Microsoft MVP as well, and I see a lot of uh, content and, and a, a lot of things that you put out uh, for the community is around Microsoft Lists and and uh, how good they are and the advantages and the benefits of of using Microsoft Lists. So I'd, I'd be keen to get your thoughts on um, you know the uh, I guess the, the benefits of using Microsoft lists versus uh, let's say a, an Excel spreadsheet, because a lot of, um, you know, traditionally a lot of people have uh, are storing data and they're storing or, or tracking items and things like that in Excel spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's a lot of things that Microsoft lists and, and uh, like me, I, I know you love your Microsoft lists and there's a lot of things that, that I find um, once you start showing people the benefits of, of Microsoft lists and what you can do, for example, the, 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 a few things that, uh, that I find really, really useful and, and end up, uh, you know, other users find useful as well is just simple things like being able to share a a particular row or being able to comment on an item or, uh, you know, that type of thing uh, is, you know, it just adds a lot more functionality to the data and what you can do as opposed to Excel spreadsheets. I'd be keen to get your thoughts on uh, and insights into what you've seen around sort of the, the benefits and the are you seeing transition people transitioning from spreadsheets to lists and that type of thing as well? Absolutely. But sometimes it's with guidance and that's been some of my traditional experience where a user is working in a silo. They're by themselves. They have that, that business process, that, that bit of work rep reflected inside of their spreadsheet. It serves them well, but it lacks insight for others. And so there's usually some type of catalyst for change. And usually it, that catalyst is, is a move to something like teams or, or having uh, additional team members come in to help with uh, the workload. And it's at that point where, you know, collaborating on the spreadsheet off of one person's computer is just not sufficient. Fine. Let's move it up to OneDrive. Okay. That's a step in the right direction, but it's still not enough. Mm. It's still under a single user's control. And in some organizations where employee turnover is something that happens, having uh, the business of a team or an organization buried in OneDrive, it probably isn't the best choice. So surfacing that out into uh, into uh, either a SharePoint site or Microsoft Teams is a step in the right direction. So that's great. Now we have Excel. It's centralized. And Excel is good. You and I probably use it every day. But there's a, there's a bit of a free form about Excel. Like you can come in and start adding columns and changing dates and implying uh, status like uh, something is good just by changing the font color or implying that it's bad by using the same font color. But that doesn't necessarily tell the story to everyone and everything. So when we start to think about finding opportunities to add value to some of those business processes, yes, centralization is great. But if things are around a status, for example, that we can key off of and create a trigger, uh, whether that is a a message to say, hey, Daniel, you need to do something right now based on that change in that status, not from green to red, but status is good to blocked. Mm -hmm. Let's take action. And so when we start to formalize what's inside of that Excel and we move it into lists, then we start to have a more consistent and a predictable way of using the list. There's we take away some of the free form. It's not to say you can't do it in a list, but you don't make that as easy. Okay, so it's not friction that's the value here. The value is, is that you've, you've got a group, we're looking at a list and we agree on what that business process looks like. It's not up for interpretation every time someone uses something. And because it's in a list, it's centralized and people have that visibility in it. And so, we start to have more opportunities to do things like automation, value add. We start to have more opportunities to do collaboration. 
the commenting that you mentioned around a row or a list is incredibly powerful. And it's not mm -hmm. something we've always had inside of lists. And so to, to say I'm working on this particular item inside of a list that reflects a business process or a, a, a unit of work that I'm doing, the status sometimes always isn't the, the important piece. It's not the, the only part of the story. So to have that, 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 that qualitative information around it to say like, yes, the status is green, but these factors were at play to make it green. And that's something that feeds back into the team. And so this is one of the great things about lists over Excel. Uh, well, is that we can have collaboration around data. And I think that's one of the powerful things. And so uh, as, as users start to get more comfortable with uh, tools like Microsoft Lists, as they become more available in our experience and inside of Office 365, the ability to create a list that seems to be popping up on every type of interface, uh, users are going to be more likely to use it. They're going to be more likely to have their business po processes a little more structured and reflected inside of that list. Mm. And I think uh, you, you spoke about uh, business processes and uh, the Power Platform earlier on. And uh, one of the ways that they're sort of merging or combining here uh, and introducing, um, let's say, that an end user or, or shall we say citizen developers is by, you know, within Microsoft Lists, uh, you can use, uh, you know, you can start to create rules now. So mm -hmm. gone are the days where, you know, you fire up or you need to, to get IT pros or, or even a developer involved yep. into saying, and one of the key, it was funny, one of the key uh, you know, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this before. One of the functionalities that has always been uh, asked of is when this particular value changes in this column, tell me about it. And now with the introduction of, of rules in lists uh, that, you know, an end or a, a list owner can actually just create that really, really easily. And I think that the, the merging there of the power, well, the, the power platform, let's say Power Automate in, that, in this case, yeah. uh, can, you know, make and people are starting to realize how powerful these these tools are now and we're even seeing that uh and i posted well, at the time of this recording um uh, they're start we're starting to see that being introduced into document libraries now as well so the 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 merging of of the power platform and tools like lists and libraries is starting to become really really powerful for for any user incredibly empowering for users and I've been in, in small IT organizations and large IT organizations, and um, we're, we're never really commended for our, our ability to move fast. Mm -hmm. And so getting out of the way of users who know what they want to do and giving them a, a tool set like a rule where they can add value to their own day-to-day -day activities is huge. And the rules experience, it's very simple, you know, it's a if value is equal to that, then send message. It's, it's fantastic. It's, it's mm. cornerstone for a lot of automation and you don't always need uh, that heavy hand of it, that, uh, that, that big project all the time, just to get something like this done. So now you have rules, you have the ability to take that Excel spreadsheet that you're mentioning and bring it into, to list. You have the ability to add it to a tab in teams. Like all of a sudden it's like, the data has now become the application, mm. like the data as a platform. So I have this, if I, if I have uh, an Apple or an iOS uh, mobile device, I can use the list app and it, it has everything I need. Um, I have an application for mobile. I have an application of the desktop. The data is the important piece and it's no longer about building things around the data. It's about configuring things around the data that work for you or work for the team that you're working on. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, also uh, another part uh, and recently announced also is, uh, especially with, with Microsoft Lists, and I think this is a really powerful feature, is, is offline access uh, or th that feature of, of being able to, to integrate um, or, sorry, I interact with your lists uh, while offline. Now, we've, we've had that, uh, I guess, with files and, and that type of thing, but not with actual data itself. And we're seeing now that Microsoft also, over the course of, of 
the last year or so are really starting to double down on the performance side of things and, and making things load faster. And uh, I saw a stat the other day around, you know, they're, they're saying that they're, Microsoft are delivering a, a 57% improvement in page interactivity along with the ability to work with this data offline. Um, and, and we've seen with OneDrive uh, and now Microsoft lists the ability to install it as an app or a, a PWA if, yep. in, in this case. So being and having that that app like experience and you know cross platform interoperability uh, and, and that type of thing. And now also with the I guess there's, there's this project that's called Project Nucleus and, and that's uh, from, from Microsoft and that's giving us now the ability to interact with lists while offline. And there's so many different use cases with, with that type of, of uh, feature, whether it's, you know, frontline workers or, uh, you know, people out in the road or, or whatever the case may be. I, I think that offline capability is something that's going to, again, just only increase the, the use of, of Microsoft lists. Absolutely. It it seems so understated of an announcement to say that your list can be available when you're not online. I mean, mm. you and I are online all the time. We're probably online more than we should be. But for those people who are in bandwidth constrained parts of the world, or think of the, uh, the person who is like doing maintenance work inside of a tunnel underneath a, a building, like that's a reality for, mm. for most people. And so to have things like information that will support them in their activities when they're offline is huge. And so they can also capture that information, which means it's getting written back to the list when they're back online. That's mind boggling. If, you're, if you've been in IT for a while, you know this type of replication is, uh, is not something simple. So to have it just show up and be on, and again, like the, like when there's no app for that type of uh, scenarios where people are not always going to get a fancy enterprise application to suit their needs, mm. a mobile app, a list that's been created to, that supports offline access. Can we have people on the road or in those, those locations where they just can't get access enabled, supported? And that's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Now, you also you also do quite a bit of work in terms of, of uh, I guess, customization of lists and the, the UI, the look and feel and, yeah. um, you know, representing the data, not just as, as you know, like you would probably see in an Excel spreadsheet. So there's there's a lot of ways that that, that can be done now out of the box. There's, um, you know, conditional, conditional formatting and, and that type of thing. Uh, but there are ways in which you can do that uh, or take that to the next level, I guess. So how how could we do that now? And how, I guess, what's the, the, the best approach? Where can people get started in, in finding out more about that? There's a, there's a number of different ways that you can start customizing the list. The one way is to expand the user experience. And so you talked about conditional formatting. So if, uh, if a, if a value in a column is, is equal to, a, or a column in a, in a list is, a, is of a certain value, you can change the look and feel, change the color, make it bold, uh, give it an icon, whatever. The idea is that you're drawing visual attention to that, that, that column or that row, uh, whatever the case might be. And, and that works really well. And it's a, it's an awesome way to add value. It, it gives users the, that quick glance. I know where to focus my attention. But then there's also the, the forms that are associated with lists when you, when you create an or, or edit a, a list item. And so, you know, that default form slides in off of the, uh, the right and the columns are listed there. And it's a nice experience, but if you needed to customize it, um, you know, in the past, you'd have to use Power Apps and Power Apps is a great platform, but it, it is a kind of a development tool and mm. you would create this this experience that was a bit different than what the rest of your list would do. And, and I, and I suppose more importantly, not every user is, is willing or, or has the desire to take on that technical debt associated with customizing that form and maintaining it just to rearrange a, 
uh, a list column or hide something, you know, it's like, it's, it could be heavy handed. And that's the way it was for a very long time. But now they have some new options. And one of the new options is that you can reconfigure the form and, you know, you can do drag and drop reorder. You can hide show, you can do some conditional logic to show things or hide things. And that's a great step forward. Now you're, you're improving the user interface just through some simple configuration, no technical debt whatsoever. But then you have this third option and where we can use uh, uh, some of the same uh, code that's available behind the scenes for the, the column formatting and apply it to the, the header of the form, to the footer of the form and to the body. And so now you can bring other visual elements and you can turn what's just a simple form of uh, list columns into almost like an application experience where you can break out sections of those columns to be uh, grouped by a, a business purpose. You could add uh, visual acuity to things and you can really get uh, heavy handed at it and uh, make for a really pleasant experience. So that's the first way you can extend lists. The other way, again, that that's, that's something that, you know, three or four years ago, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have even dreamt about being able to do right. So, you know, customizing forms and having a custom form in that experience, um, you know, always led to, you know, custom development or, or, you know, getting a developer involved in that and, and now having the ability to do that or, um, you know, obviously need, needing some some education and training and, and that type of thing. But it's something that that people can actually start to do themselves. And I think that's really, really powerful. And it's only going to continue to, to improve in, in that area. Oh, absolutely true. And I can read computer code like that someone has written, but I'm just along for the ride. I, I couldn't write that stuff to save my life. And so um, some of the, the lists that I've, I've customized, I've used the samples that exist on some of the Microsoft GitHub projects. And updated them simply to, to suit my needs. I'm not a developer. The people who wrote them much smarter than I am, but I'm able to take those, those awesome samples that they put out there and apply them. Yeah. And, and I use that and I'll link to these in the show notes as well, but there is a, a great repository of, of uh, list formatting co um, and, and column formatting and things like that for that have, uh, you know, as I said, the, the community, uh, has has developed themselves, and they're really really good resources for people to start to get uh, get accustomed to how to to customize uh, the, these type of things as well. And I use them quite yeah quite significantly when um, you know doing you know needing to do some simple things like putting traffic lights on on statuses or, or anything like that. Oh. Um, you know all of those sort of common things. That there's things that are and resources that are already there ready to go that. Uh, I guess people don't don't really know about, um, and and once they start to to get educated in that, really do um, you know take things to to the next level. And I'm not sure about you, but I think all of that all of that type of of customization really does help to enhance the 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 adoption and the usability. And and people will will go back and and start to use Microsoft lists uh, a lot more and more for for different use cases. Absolutely. Uh, my boss is a very busy man and he doesn't have time to, to go through all the details of the work that we do that we reflect inside of our lists. And so I took this uh, amazing sample from the GitHub community and it was like a, a progress tracker. Mm. And so we could identify five columns in the list that represented the major milestones in each project that we were executing. And as you change the status, it, within those five designated columns, you know, the, the five dots on that one list column would start to fill in with solid colors. So my boss could come in and just say, customer X, go across, see the status column and see that it was four out of five stars complete or circles complete. Mm. And uh, he could, you know, just glance and get information and not have to open the book, so to speak, to, uh, to see that type of information. So there's a lot there and, that, and that's on the front end. Um, a lot of people also take a similar approach to extending the functionality with the back end stuff. So using things like Power Automate to uh, move data around or manipulate the data or to take action based on the data. And 
I find myself spending a lot of time in that area because it's it's very practical where, where people will have event-based triggers to do things, uh, whether it's more of those uh, uh, rules, but more enhanced events where yeah. we're, we're sending things like uh, at Microsoft Teams adaptive card uh, to say like, you know, Daniel, here's, mm. here's your list of projects, which ones need to be updated, closed, and do it in the context of Teams. And that's the next level of a lot of this stuff is to not the content switch between lists and teams, but to do it where you're spending most of your time and bring yeah. pushing that type of traffic to teams. Yeah. And do you think that, do you, you know, you're heavily involved in the community as well as a, as an MVP and, and are you seeing that the, the, you know, implementing those type of things is becoming more, uh, or, or there's more interest now in just the, the, the information worker type of persona as opposed to IT pros and, and that type of thing, uh, especially around process automation and being able to, because there's a lot of times, and I still see it as well, where the education factor or the, the, the knowledge of what Power Automate in particular can do around data and how easy it is uh, you know, there's so many different templates that uh, a, a normal uh, an end user can start to, to just implement themselves. Are you seeing from what you're doing yourself, are you seeing that that's becoming more mainstream now that just, you know, the the general information worker is starting to, to implement these sort of things themselves? I think we're seeing a lot of that for the personal productivity. Yep. The ones that will build something that triggers off of their own inbox or their OneDrive. Mm -hmm. um, and you're also seeing people in starting to advocate for those, the, those, those, just the, the not the, the business users, excuse me, yeah. more empathy for what they're doing and, and stewardship to say, let's provide guidance. Like if you have an opportunity to add value, let's introduce some of these tools. And maybe it's not the traditional IT engagement where they're spinning up a new project and getting mm -hmm. approvals and funding, but more like, let's go sit with a user for an hour or two and try and add value through something like automation and using mm -hmm. Power Automate. Uh, and that turns into a gateway where they're, um, they're empowered. They have the tools at their disposal. In an ideal situation, IT is putting up guardrails to protect the organization's information assets to make sure things are not leaking out, things are done um, in line with the licensing that they have and can be taken over if need be. Should a solution grow into something more than just a personal productivity app? So m more empathy on that front. And the tools are being, they're just, they're surfaced more like Power Automate, Power Apps, Power BI, all the Power Platform apps are like, native applications inside of Microsoft Teams now. Mm. Uh, I can communicate with Flow using a bot. I can do it in the context of a chat with you over Teams. And so the more it's exposed, the more it's available, the more it's blessed by traditional IT, the more likely people are going to use it. And they're going to find the, real, the really unique use cases. And they're the ones who are going to come up with the really cool solutions to the problems. Mm. And I think oh, well, you coming from an education background as well. I, I think once people are, you know, are made aware of of all of these things as well, uh, and then getting educated on on how to use it, I, I think, uh, you know, that, that's only going to to again in, increase um, the uh, the the usage and the adoption of of you know all of the the, the platform together. Um, and uh, we speak a, a lot about uh, you know it's not a um, it's not uh, this or that. It's more of an and type of, of conversation. And I think this is th these are perfect examples of, of how um, you know it's a it's a this and that as opposed to an or. I mean, you've got lists around with all your data. You've got all the collaboration around all of that inside of Microsoft Teams. But now we've got you know the Power Platform adding so much more capabilities around mm -hmm. uh, data. Um, and I, I know one of your uh, well, Power BI is is something that you're um, you know very heavily invested in as well. But now we can even utilize Power BI from the lists UI and visualize mm -hmm. the data. Um, and, and again, something that that you, you you probably wouldn't have dreamt about doing you know a couple of no. years ago. No, and it's it's literally a click of a button. Mm. 
and you get this pretty nice Power BI report. Is it going to be something as fancy as a professional data scientist is going to do? I don't know, but I do know that you get a really good starting point and there's a really good chance that if you're, if you're using something like Microsoft list, you're probably not going to have highly complex requirements. Mm, yeah. And so those, those modest requirements are usually met with that out of the box offering or with a little bit of customization and customization is not a four letter word in this case. Yeah. A couple of, couple toggles of a button inside of Power BI and Power BI, if you've never used that inter interface on the desktop tool, it, it is, a, it can be heavy handed, mm. a lot of new concepts to, to take in, but it is a, su a simplified experience and it's, uh, I've tried it, I've used it and I work at an analytics company and wasn't that far off the mark, what we would have built. So yeah, I think it's pretty great. Yeah. Now. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. You, you mentioned before about some things that you've implemented yourself um, around uh, the customization of, of lists. So mm -hmm. you mentioned before uh, progress tracker um, and, you know, potentially posting uh, an adaptive card to Microsoft Teams uh, to, to inter interact with, with the data in there. Yeah. Um, what are some other interesting ways in which you've customized, uh, whether it's for your, you, you know, your organization, your personal use or, or for, for, for people in the community, how have you, what are some other examples of, of how you've used lists in that way? Uh, I, I always find that lists are, they will, they're st storing the data, and the data will trigger an event. And so the event is usually a notification of some sort. Um, the adaptive card one is great. So, mm. and we use this at our work. Uh, when we start to onboard a new customer, uh, there's a sequence of events that has to happen. So we will execute, uh, they're almost like approvals, but we're using adaptive cards because you're able to deliver more information to the user for them to do their job without having to click into another tool like Microsoft list to retrieve all the information. So that's the, the first value. Uh, they, they get, you get the notification saying, Hey, new customer to onboard, uh, is your step complete? Click yes. Boom. It comes back to me. Then in parallel it goes to the next person because there's no dependencies on that. And so you get this nice experience where they, they stay inside of teams. They do the work that they have to do for the onboarding and just click complete and it's done. So kind of that's a traditional view. Yeah. Uh, have uh, one list customization where it was inspired by um, a, a jagged piece of metal coming out of a building. And every time I walked past it at my previous job, I was like, that thing's really dangerous. It looks like a, a sword. It's so sharp and sticking out. I should really notify. I didn't know who to notify at the university. And I was like, there's gotta be an easy way for me just to take a picture of this. And then someone just can go do something with it. And so customized a list. Well, you could take that picture and it would submit the uh, simple metadata. Like what is the, lo the general location of this, this image that you're sending and it sent it off to the health and safety. Uh, it could send it off to the health and safety committee for them to uh, review, to know if it is something that they need to address and then send out a team to fix it and then have an approval thing. And so it ended up being a very big solution, but it was just based on that, that mm -hmm. piece of metal that was hanging off the corner of a building. Also find that people are, are, are really trying to, to push lists to their maximum, like the maximum that you can do for, uh, uh, reporting and getting data and notifications back out. And so uh, you'll notice with a list when you're doing anything inside of something like Power Automate, it's always at like an item level. There's rarely any triggers actions around multiple rows. And so what people will want to do is to uh, have a series of rows. Maybe it's based on ownership from that list to say, give me a, a listing of all the users associated with uh, this task and then send them in individual uh, reminders or summaries of multiple items. And um, 
in that particular one, that was one of the more complex flows that I wrote and uh, continues to get uh, a, a lot of traffic on, on my blog site about uh, one email for multiple list items. So things like that. Um, is, that like really a, is, is that like a, a, a scheduled power automate or, or something that runs regularly? That's right. So like yeah. a, a weekly project listing report yeah. for everyone to show their projects. Uh, quite complicated, learned a lot, probably took like two weeks to write the flow, but uh, to know that it's helping others is good. And I use it at work as well. So it's pretty handy. Yeah. And I think, that, I mean, that's what I love about these, uh, talking about these type of use cases, because uh, people that are, are watching and listening can can sort of take in um, these sort of real world examples and start to, to think about how they could, you know, use this type of, of uh, process automation to, even if it does take you two weeks uh, to, to implement something like that, you know, the, the benefits down the track, uh, you know, it might save you, I don't know, X, X amount of minutes per Per, th yeah. per thing, but over the course of a period of time, that's going to be a, a hell of a lot of time saving. And and one of the, the things I picked up there as, as well when you're explaining a few of those was trying to enhance the the employ the experience there. So uh, there's a big big push at the moment for reducing context switching and staying in mm -hmm. the flow of work and things like that. And and obviously Microsoft Teams is is a place where we find a lot of people and, and you and I spend a lot of time in, in teams as well. And being able to stay in that one place, um, you know, with lists coming in and then you've got uh, adaptive cards coming in, you, you're staying in context and you're staying in that um, in that that flow of, of where you're actually working. And, and again, that's going to be saving time, um, cutting down on, on distractions and having to, to jump out into different, uh, applications or different browsers or, or things like that as well. So I think the, you know, those examples that you've outlined there, are, I think are, are really powerful as well. Great. Now, as we wrap things up, mate, it's been really good uh, chatting to you about all, all of um, everything that's happening in Microsoft List, how you're using it, uh, you know, and, and a, a lot of uh, good, really good use cases that you've, uh, that you're using it for as well. Now, you do post a lot, uh, being an MVP in the community and everything like that. So for everybody that's that's watching and listening, how can we stay up to date with, with what you're doing, uh, the content that you're putting out? Uh, where can we find you? Thank you. Uh, please reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I believe my handle there is norm-young and on Twitter uh, at Stormin underscore 30. And if you like, come visit me on my blog site at normyoung.ca. Uh, it's always nice to, to connect with people and to, to find out how you're using the tools like Power Automate and List. And uh, it's been one of my joys where to, to know that those, those articles that I put together on my blog uh, continue to get uh, lots of viewership. But more importantly, people are engaging, trying to get help, and I'll help as often as I can. So yeah, and, and there's... There's obviously quite a lot of uh, new innovations and things coming out to Microsoft Lists, which I'm sure you'll be across, and I'm sure you'll publish a, a lot of content around that too. So uh, for everybody watching, listening, uh, be sure to uh, jump onto to Norm's uh, socials, uh, blog site, and, and LinkedIn especially uh, to stay up to date with everything that, that Norm's doing. I'll post all the links in the in the show notes as well. Uh, so, mate, very, very um, appreciative of, of you taking some time. I know it's a little bit late in the day here this always um amuses me on on time differences here uh so so obviously i'm in melbourne um it is now sort of mid-morning my morning but it's late in the day the previous day where you are so uh, That's right. i will wrap things up there and let you go but thanks again for joining me it's been a, a great chat thanks daniel absolute pleasure to be here really appreciate it